in, in the area of robotics and automation. Uh, we're now going to hear Professor Simon Pearson, who's also from, uh, uh, from the University of, uh, of Lincoln, who's going, he's the founding director of the Lincoln Institute of Agri-Food Technology. And that department, I think he's probably going to talk a bit more about what it does, but it pulls together some of the expertise across lots of different departments in the university uh, that, that, that all come to bear, that could be brought to bear on the area of farm farming and food production. Um, on, ongoing work uh, with Professor Pearson's team include projects on agri-robotics, including the development of robotic harvesting machinery and fleets of small autonomous field robots and numerous applications of robotics in food processing environments. So please again give a warm welcome to Professor Simon Pearson. this opportunity to come and talk to you that's um and thanks tom so we we had to sort of sort out our slides and uh, I, i'm sure tom got most of mine <laughs> so um what i've been asked to do really think uh three or four uh technologies which may shape agriculture in the future and what i was asked to do is really sort of think about what's going to shape farming in around by about 2030 so you think 2030 is about 13 years away so what i'm going to do is just pitch in about four ideas uh, about, about the future of farming, what farming may, might look like. Um, before I do that, I just want to just mention uh, a little bit about uh, my little institute, so it's uh, abbreviated LIAT, uh, Lincoln Institute of Agri-Food Technology. And Lincoln, uh, we're a relatively new university, so we've been around for about 15 years, but clearly being in the middle of Lincolnshire, agriculture and food is a pretty big theme at the university. We don't have a school of, uh, of agriculture as such, uh, we have the institute, uh, but within the uh, university we have a very big college of science, and in the college of science, it's a very classic college of science, we've got core schools of computer science, which Tom's from, engineering, chemistry, National Centre for Food Manufacturing, maths, physics, life science, geography. And all I do, and my team do, is really network uh, amongst the, uh, my colleagues in the college, and then network with industry and match projects. And, uh, and uh, so we're a very small institute, but we have quite a big impact in the university. And uh, to date, about 25% of all of the academic staff in the College of Science at the University of Lincoln are researching agri-food technology. So we've leveraged the entire uh, college uh, via the use of, uh, of, of LIAT. So uh, agri-food in Lincoln is a very, very big thing. What I want to do is, before I uh, uh, talk about the, the, the farm of the future, I just want to talk a bit about the farm of today. And I've just pulled up a few um, statistics, just to give a, 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 a flavour on, uh, on, on the state of farming. Uh, and I've used the latest data set from the Farm Business Survey just to uh, give you an indication of the state of farming. And uh, we're talking about arable farming here, and I just want to just reflect on some of these things. So in the Farm Business Survey, the, the net uh, profit uh, for, for cereal farmers, 2014, 15, and 15, 16, was 45,000 pounds and 35,000 um, pounds. But the devil's really in the detail, and uh, what the Farm Business Survey shows is how this profitability is, is, is derived. And a very big proportion of cereal farming profit is from the basic payment scheme. Uh, diversified income, so that's, um, that's uh, other energy businesses or shops, uh, et cetera, uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a relatively large lump. Agri-environment schemes is a small lump, but there's a real issue here. This is agriculture. This is the profit from core agriculture activity, i.e. growing crops. And in these two years, arable farming was making a loss. So that's not a healthy uh, position to start with. Um, it's a little bit better in horticulture, general cropping a bit better, uh, and very variable in terms of sort of animal uh, production as well. So it's a bit of a concern. We're going into Brexit. We don't know what the new British agriculture policy is going to be, and the core activity of farming is, uh, is not showing a, 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 a huge amount of profitability. Um, the devil's in the detail, though. So what I've done here is, again, from the Farm Business Survey, it's just taken out the cost of production of a tonne of wheat amongst their entire survey. And this shows the cost of production. So these are uh, less than £100 
and then you've got some farms which are producing wheat at, at, uh, at over £250 a tonne. So if anybody knows the price of wheat, that's not a very sustainable business to, uh, to be had. Uh, and this, this cut here is, is, the, is the profitable farms, and this is the not profitable farms. You can see about 50% within the farm business survey of uh, farms are not profitable. So what does that mean? We've got to really drive productivity uh, 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 as hard as we possibly can. Driving productivity, you could, you could say, well, I'll increase yield. But what I've shown here is just the yield data from DEFRA uh, of the British wheat crop. And you can see it's, it's ranging. This is from 1880. It's a wonderful data set. Uh, nothing really happens until the Second World War. Uh, then we get uh, herbicides, more mechanization. Uh, plant breeding's coming in up here, pesticides are coming in up here, and then it gets to about uh, 1990, then starts to level off, and then it also starts to get much more variable. Uh, why this variability is increasing, we don't know. It might be weather, it might be all sorts of things that we're doing to the agricultural system. But it is a concern that we're starting to see this, this plateau. So is yield going to get us out of this predicament? Uh, it, it may do. But if you're a betting person, you've really got to bet on driving productivity as a priority if history is dictating that, that yield is, is, uh, is, is plateauing off. So productivity is going to be all important. Uh, back to productivity again. Uh, it's, the agriculture sector doesn't have a huge uh, a reputation within the British economy. This is data from the Office of National Statistics 2016 and shows that agriculture's got the lowest productivity of any industry in the UK. Food is slightly better, but there's a, there is a productivity uh, 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 issue in, uh, in farming. Why that into the future uh, and Brexit? So the AHDB last year estimated that about 115,000 people are employed in UK agriculture. I actually think that underestimates. Of those 22,000 are EU migrants, that's full-time employees, uh, um, uh, all-year-round employees, and then 67,000 seasonal workers. So uh, that's a very large number of people. If you add in the extra 135,000 in the food sector, you can see that there's going to be, uh, uh, there's a lot of people, uh, and if we restrict uh, uh, fr uh, movement of people post-Brexit, there's going to be a big challenge, hence why we're really focusing on uh, agri-robotics at Lincoln, particularly around the produce sector where a large number of these people are, 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 are required, and also in the food sector uh, where a large number of these people are required. So robotics is going to be a key enabling technology. Uh, and then there's, there's other issues, and this is the famous uh, video which uh, Tom, Tom mentioned. Uh, uh, this, is, this is not myself or Tom driving that thing. Uh, this is some poor guy in Norway once again, but you can see the, these, these situations are, are real life uh, uh, situations. Difficult to go home and explain what you've done there, isn't it? <laughs> so, but, so why is that? Well, uh, everyone's worried about soil health, quite rightly so. This is some data from Rothamsted. This shows the soil organic carbon from arable farming since 1950, and it's generally uh, decreasing. Um, it's not irreversible. If you put grass back, soil carbon builds very slowly. It builds at a slower rate than you lose it. So, so there, are, there is a general concern about uh, soil health, and we need technologies to, to deal with some of these situations. Right, so, uh, but it's not all gloom, and I think Tom's given some inspiration uh, uh, for, the, for the future. And uh, what I would say is we are in the middle of what I call the fourth uh, agricultural revolution, and that's really digital technology. And uh, one of the big enabling technologies of the future will be digital technology. That includes robotics, connecting data sources, connectivity, use of data, bioinformatics, in internet of things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomy. All these technologies are going to be underpinning for the future. Um, so, but what are the game-changing technologies? And uh, I've got uh, uh, my first two Technology one, I'm going to say autonomous vehicles. Tom's given a great talk on, on autonomy, and, uh, and I'm not going to talk about agricultural autonomy. I'm going to show a little video in a minute just showing the rate of change of technology development behind autonomy, really to prove my point that I think autonomy is going to be key 
because the rate of change of autonomous vehicles in, in general industry over the last 13 years has been phenomenal. So we don't know what's going to happen in the next 13 years. And then I'm going to talk, uh, and I'm going to show a little video which just shows my which will be interoperable uh, autonomous vehicles providing real-time information, the connected farm. Uh, now, uh, again, when you see this video, this is a, you're going to see a clip of some military technology. Uh, but a, what, what I want you to think about when you see this clip is uh, uh, how can that military technology be used in the farming situation. In the military technology, uh, you'll have a, a, a complex um, set of autonomous sensors which are sensing the battlefield and providing uh, information to, to, uh, to people to, 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 to effect decisions. The key thing about military technology is it relies on a very large number of sensors which are all interoperable. Um, OK, we'll come on to this in a sec. So this little video, the, the, the music I did for it is from 2004. Just to put you back in the uh, picture in 2000. And this is the Garpa Grand Challenge. Broken. Oh, that's like a moonwalker thing. And these uh, these vehicles had to travel, I think, 100 miles over from the Harvey Desert. This is a good one. Look at this guy. Oh, damn! <laughs> So, so uh, in the DARPA Grand Challenge of 2000, not one autonomous vehicle made it. Wind up 13 years, uh, 13 years uh, to 2017, and then you've got this. And what I want you to think about is, is, the, is the, the rate that that, that technology has developed. So that's a control system on a Tesla car hands free. That's happened in 13 years. So I've got no doubt uh, uh, it, that if we wind that clock forward into agriculture, we're going to see some very tremendous developments in the next 13 years. So what will happen in the next 13 years? So another example that's farming's tomorrow, it's here today, and this is the, the military technology I want to show you about connecting multiple sensors. Uh, this is a, a Royal Navy um, uh, material. There was an exercise in 2016, had 50 uh, UAVs from 20 nations, all different uh, sensors and uh, devices, and they're all interoperable. This is groundbreaking. This is completely new. It's enhancing what we've got. It's really innovative. It's been fantastically exciting. No longer are the militaries of the world the only people who in some way owned technology development. It is easy for our adversaries to access, it is cheap, it is proliferating around the world. How do we continue to operate in a 21st century maritime battle space in order to maintain a warfighting cutting edge? The capability offered by unmanned and increasingly autonomous technology is advancing at a rapid rate. Unmanned vehicles are doing things that have never been done before, creating new possibilities, challenging the way we operate. But can they work together? Can they give our operational commanders a better understanding of their environment and a competitive edge? Can they reduce the risks faced by our armed forces? And can they perform in the real world, a harsh and unforgiving environment? From here, Unmanned Warrior was born. So, so 
the point is the military is now integrating multiple UAVs. Uh, this is what farming needs, will do in the future. So uh, in farming at the moment, we'll have a, um, an environment space where we've got a whole range of sensors. Uh, this is a, a source from Bayer. So you might have satellite sensors, UAVs, uh, other, other devices measuring crops, uh, communication systems, weather systems, uh, biophysical models. Uh, and what we need to do is integrate all of these technologies together into one data control system for decision support. That, I think, is one of the future uh, technologies for farming. And my point is, is that that's used in the military today. So by 2030, I do expect to see that in farming. I don't think, at the moment, one of these technologies on its own provides the information that we need to have a comprehensive view of the farming system. And it's the, it's the integration of all these systems which will be the, the key step. Interoperability is going to be key, and, uh, and, uh, and the way that data is transferred from one machine to another will be, uh, will be key. So, uh, uh, game changer uh, uh, number uh, three, uh, I've got robot-ready farms, uh, and also electric farms and new genetics. Which, so, robot-ready, which is underpinned by electric farms and new genetics. This is a wonderful picture here. This idea of electric farms is not a, uh, it's not a new idea. This is from the University of Reading in 1955, uh, and this is uh, uh, the, the one of the first ever electric farms. And this little poor chap here is wired up to a 400-volt cable. <laughs> it's praying it doesn't rain or there's a lightning strike. There's something pretty cloudy going on here. I don't know whether he survived that very long. So the idea of electric farms is, uh, is, not, is not a new idea, but I think we're going to have a better realisation of, of, of that. Uh, when I say electric farms, I, I think it's already here. Um, and this is uh, just a, a little clip from John Deere of an electric tractor, one of the first ones. And I'll just show you this. Uh, and here you go, it's a John Deere. So this, this thing's got a life of about three hours. And basically, that's just a huge block of AA batteries, more or less. Uh, and I've got no doubt that, that, that electric is going to be one of the game changers of the future. It's got a long way to go. We need innovations in battery technology uh, and control systems. But it's CO2 neutral, emission three. Here we go. An incredibly high torque. So each of these wheels has got its own, uh, own, own, own motor. I can't remember the horsepower these things pull, but it's, it's really, really pretty terrific. So electric uh, farms and electric vehicles, I think, will be uh, key. I'll keep going. Uh, and then the other part of robot-ready farms will be genetics. As Tom mentioned, broccoli harvesting. This is some uh, broccoli harvesters in, uh, in uh, California. What you see is that conventional varieties in California, you can't see the, the crop. And as Tom mentioned, um, uh, one of the reasons why uh, the, our training set in Spain was, was, uh, uh, was not as, as good as our training set in the UK, was you get all these problems with occlusions and leaves. Uh, what we're going to see is a transformation of plant genetics, uh, which will be robot ready. So this variety has been specifically bred uh, really with, with automated harvesting in mind. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of the, these innovations coming through, particularly in the produce area. And you see this, this, this variety, it's a, a, a seminist variety. Uh, it's upright, it's standing. It's very easy to recognise with the camera system. There's no occlusions. And these are the crops of the future that we're going to see. So it won't, be just, it won't just be uh, a robotics engineering solutions. There'll be a combination with, with genetics and, and conventional plant breeding. Then my final slide, so what are the game change technologies for, for 2030? I just thought I'd throw this in. Uh, will farmers exist? Are we going to be here? There's lots in the news about uh, urban farms, so this idea of growing crops indoors using LED lights and uh, controlled atmosphere systems. Um, so, um, uh, so, so my question is, will farms exist? Uh, the good news is on this, and uh, I've just run some costing models. Uh, plant physiology data, and uh, the good news for any wheat farm of a uh, kilo of wheat in an urban farm 
is over £100 a, a, a kilo. So, so I think you boys who are growing cereals are... 30. Uh, uh, however, anyone growing lettuce... You, 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 this is per cost. This is grid electricity, and it's 63p. Resources. This has got real potential. This is going to happen. Uh, but you're pretty safe with your wheat, so, uh, so you don't need to sell up worrying about urban farm on wheat. Uh, and that's that's really it. So those are my four uh, my my four predictions for the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Oh, sorry, that was a bit loud. Thank you very much, Professor Pearson. Okay, um, we're going to have a ten-minute comfort break now while we reset the stage and I'm going to then ask Professor Duckett and Professor Pearson to join me back on the stage